So we're going to keep looking at the parable of the talents, which is in Matthew chapter 25. If you are inclined to turn there uh, or tap there, whatever, whatever mode you are in. For those who don't have it memorized. And uh, we, we started and looked at the first part of that lesson and left a, a, uh, left a shoe very precarious, waiting to drop the second half of this uh, parable. And uh, it's part of the larger theme of created in him for good works. And I intend by these things to encourage us to on to action and one of the theme verses would be Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And that is intended to be a word of encouragement there in Galatians 6, uh, as is the other. You know, God is not mocked. What a person sows, this shall he also reap, which is less of a threat, more of a promise that your good work will not be forgotten. The work you do in the Lord will not be uh, overlooked by the real judge the final judge, God in heaven. So we ought to continue strong, knowing that there is a due season. That due season may not be today. We, we were going to work today, but we may have to wait a little bit, but it will come and we must hold on and not give up. Stay that course and remain in the faith. Um, here we are. One of the things that occurs there in Matthew 25 um, I'm trying to find myself on this page here. Oh, there we are. Was something at verse 26 where the master called him a wicked and a slothful servant. And I wanted to look at that word slothful very closely because what he had said at verse, um, you know, at verse 25 of Matthew 25 was, I was afraid and went and hid your talent. And so, um, Slothful was not really the word that I was thinking of regarding that servant, although he was said to be evil or wicked and slothful. And that made me wonder at this. Well, what is the meaning of this word and why, why would we use that? I would think to myself, well, fear was motivating the man. But as the Lord tells it, it's both wickedness and slothfulness. Um, so I went and looked at the, uh, you know, at the lexicon to see the definition of the word there translated slothful, and it is uh, shrinking or timid or reluctant, which does fit the idea that he was afraid. He was shrinking from the task that had been handed to him. The master's property had been handed to him to watch over this, but also to make good of it while the master was gone for a long time. So to be shrinking or timid, to be reluctant with what God has given us is going to lead to an outcome we don't, we don't want. That will lead to us not acting, not doing what we should do. So that's a, that's a real trap there. Um, but then, you know, that word is also used to mean idle or sluggish, uh, but it's also used to describe things, not just a servant, but if you're talking about a thing, you're talking about a thing that makes people afraid uh, or a thing that is troublesome to people. So it's a little bit of that concept of what he said, I was afraid, so I hid it. And it's to say there's an, I guess there's an enormity of the task, that God has given us something that is significant. And we maybe rightly 
have a certain amount of um, maybe anxiety about, oh, you know, that's that's pretty serious. That's pretty big. And I think I say rightly because it's true. Our lives are worth something. They're worth a great deal. And God has given us these so that we might give him something back for it, that we might return a blessing. Um, and if you stop and think about it, well, it is something you know, to respect, to have a, a healthy fear, we would say, a healthy respect for the size of that task. But uh, to be slothful, though, is to go too far, to allow that fear to be in the driver's seat. And that same word appears in Romans 12, which was the thing that caught my attention. And I realized that Romans 12 actually talks about this at length. So that's the first place we're going to go outside of Matthew. It's Romans chapter 12, where he says, you know, at the 11th verse, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. It's fairly clear that slothful is the same. The wicked and slothful servant, don't be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. And you see how consistent that is with the lesson of Matthew 25, that he allowed that fear or sloth to overcome his productivity. He did not produce for the master. And that was not fervent in spirit. That did not serve the Lord or serve the master. But this idea started, you know, earlier in the chapter, Romans 12.1, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Um, and the word there is actually worship according to reason or according to the word or according to logic. It's reasonable, but specifically related to the word. We are using the Word as we worship God. The Word orders our life. And it's by this Word of God that we present ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And so when we say, be not slothful, but be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, in the idea of presenting the bodies as a living sacrifice, Romans 12.1, it means diligence and courage. Diligence on the one hand, meaning watchful, thinking about what am I doing? How am I doing? How are we doing getting something for God here? On the one hand, on the other hand, it takes courage because you're putting yourself on the line. You're the servant. You're the one paying the price if you're doing the work, you know. And sometimes it costs more than others. But it does. It takes diligence, yes, but it takes courage, too, and that overcomes the fear. Because we're, you know, being mindful, we're instructed by the Word, which includes Matthew 25, that, well, God has entrusted something to me because He knows something about me. He gave it to me because I could do this, because I could make a return with this. And so... I can get a certain amount of courage, a certain amount of boldness from that, putting my trust not in myself, but in the Lord who entrusted this to me. To step out there and do this, take it on, be courageous. But, you know, in the rest of the chapter, he speaks about the fact that there's different measures of grace, meaning the, the gifts of God, given to everyone, and, and people have different things that they're good at or things that they're able to do or opportunities that are available to them that they can use in the service of God. But the overall idea in the 6th through 8th verses of Romans 12, the overall idea is this, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, 
the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. But the big picture is, again, the start of verse 6. Let us use them. (laughs) We have differing abilities, if you will, differing talents, like talent show talents, (laughs) not the unit of money. Uh, different opportunities, that's true. It's always true. But whatever it is we have, let's use it. Leverage that. Make good on that, right? And if our service is, or if what we're good at is serving, well, let's use that. Let's go, let's get busy with serving. So this is about what am I doing for others? What am I doing for others? You see it there, it's kind of between the lines in 6 through 8 of Romans 12, but He said, if in service, well, you know, if we have service, then let us use the serving. Uh, If we can teach, well, let's use that teaching. If we can exhort, let's exhort people. If somebody can contribute, let them do it with generosity. Who does acts of mercy, let them do it with cheerfulness. Because you could get begrudging about these things, like, ah, I'm kind of put out by this. You know, well, I'm, I'm supposed to be helping you, so I'll help. But, you know, it's kind of getting burdensome here. You know, that's not going to work. He said to do so with cheerfulness is the right way to use this. That's the right kind of zeal and attitude. But what's between the lines here is this, right? If you want to stop worrying about your own situation, What's happening with me and what's going on in my life? You want to stop worrying about yourself. Get busy working for others. That's how you do it. You focus on the service. We have been given abilities, and God lets use those abilities. Put that into practice. Do acts of mercy with cheerfulness, which means I'm mindful not of myself but of others. It's the best thing. You want to stop worrying about yourself? Well, And you may have good reasons to worry about yourself. We don't mean to be dismissive of your suffering, but we're saying if that's on your mind and how do I get free of this? Well, you get free of that by serving others. Serve others. Yes, the 13th verse follows this idea when he says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Sometimes the saints are in need. We are to contribute to give of our time, to give of our effort. Look for the chance to show hospitality. Well, this doesn't mean to bring people into your home, although that could be a nice thing to do. Hospitality is really kindness to strangers. And we all of us are strangers in this world. This world is not our home. So you're looking for the opportunity to give Christians a respite. You know, they're safe when they are with you, they're talking with you. We build one another up. And that 21st verse, he said, do not be overcome by evil, overcome evil with good. And this evil is the same evil as in Matthew 25 when he said, you evil or wicked and slothful servant. So we should not be slothful in zeal, but Uh, be be fervent, be be not slothful, be fervent in zeal, serving the Lord, which is to say serving others. But also we overcome evil with good. We use the good to beat the evil rather than to be beaten ourselves. And it's the same evil as the evil and slothful servant. So we overcome the slothfulness in the spirit by a fervent zeal to serve others and to serve the Lord. We overcome evil in our lives, evil in our behavior, perhaps, or thoughts, but we also overcome evil in the lives of others, the oppression of Satan um, for those who are suffering by doing good for them. And there's great power in this. So that was the first thing that I found when I decided to go looking about slothfulness. Why would it say sloth? But the other thing that I found, and we'd be remiss to skip that, is that actually this word gets used in the book of Proverbs a lot. Slothfulness appears in the book of Proverbs a lot. 
When we look at what Jesus did in Matthew 25, like I said, it was a little confusing to me at first when I would read that passage and say, well, he said he was afraid, but the master said he was evil and lazy. And I thought those weren't the same thing. But what that is, is I was fooled too. <laughs> I thought that fear was a valid reason, but it's not. It's part and parcel of evil and slothful. How does that happen? Well, that's where the Proverbs come in. The way Jesus used that wording, you know, tells me how to interpret what I'm reading in the Proverbs. Because I used to think of the Proverbs as wisdom under the sun. You know, you hear people talk that way, especially about Ecclesiastes. Talks about under the sun. And you hear people interpreting um, Ecclesiastes and, and Proverbs as just that. Well, this is just worldly advice. Advice for living under the sun. Well, um, it is worldly advice in a sense. Uh, there, there are a lot of things there that are just advice about how to live, wisdom. But it's not merely worldly advice. The point of the Proverbs is a spiritual one. They are proverbial and they do offer worldly advice, but that is always intended as a metaphor, as a comparison for spiritual living and spiritual application, which is the thing I did not understand. I uh, was very mistaken about how to read them and how to take them. But I, I get it now, I think, or I've begun to get it anyway. They're really about being fervent in spirit, as Romans 12 says. So I just let's just walk through a handful of these. I've grabbed a few that, that were, seemed like they were um, you know, relevant, useful, interesting. And uh, the first of them is in Proverbs 6. It's verses 6 through 8 where we have, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. So the ant... And it says, oh, sluggard, and that word sluggard is indeed our word for slothful when it was translated into Greek, when this gets quoted, uh, or when it appears in the Septuagint, the Greek translation. It's that word for slothful. So, slothful person, look at the ant. Consider her ways. Be wise like she is. She has no chief, officer, or ruler, but prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. And that's the proverb. That's it. And, you know, a lot of people have said, well, you know, the Bible can't be right because it says no chief, no officer, no ruler. And we know that there's a queen ant. Yeah. That's why it says she. <laughs> which they didn't know, there was no way that, you know, the ancient Israelites knew that there was a, a female, a queen. That's something that's more recent than that. But anyway, she is the queen. Now, the point of that is not that, you know, the Bible is science or whatever. I'm just trying to be dismissive of those who are dismissive, all right? But the real point is this. The queen is herself a kind of chief steward over this uh, colony, I guess. It's an ant colony, right? Over this colony. It's like the men in Matthew 25 who are entrusted with millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars. They're chief stewards. They're in charge of, of something quite significant. So she's like them in the same way. She's been entrusted with something. But when it says she has no chief, officer, or ruler, it means she's independent. There's not somebody higher than that ant. 
the queen ant in that colony, seeing to it that things get done. She doesn't have to be nagged. She doesn't have to be reminded. She doesn't have to have somebody following up with her to see if they have what they need, <laughs> if they're ready for winter. Right? She's independent. She's taking care of it. There's a diligence there, you see, and a zeal there, an ownership, responsibility, whatever you like to call that. But see, it says that she prepares her bread in summer, which is to say foresight. She makes things happen. She thinks ahead of time so that there is time to act, and those actions have time to come to fruition, which is a gathering in the harvest as well. She gathers her food and harvest, which is to say, on the one hand, things happen, you know, as we said earlier, prepares in summer. Things happen with planning, with foresight, with forethought ahead of time, but things also happen with effort. Now is the time, we'll strike, make the effort. She does that. And you say, well, she doesn't do it. She makes the other ants do it. Well, that's fair. <laughs> you don't have to do everything yourself. You just have to be responsible. Make sure that it's being done. And that's the work of any leader, but it's the work of any person, too. Any leader, of course, is doing it this way, right? The elders don't do everything themselves. The deacons don't do everything themselves. They have oversight. They delegate. They are responsible to make sure it's being done and being done well, but that doesn't mean they have to do it themselves. So it is in our lives. We are responsible for things, and that means making sure that it's taken care of, making sure that it's happening. May not mean doing it myself. Another proverb happens right after this at 9 to 11. How long will you lie there, sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber. Want like an armed man. It's Proverbs 6, 9 through 11. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? Well, they lie there, um, on the one hand, saying that they're just, they're staying in place. You know, not moving, leaving well enough alone. <laughs> you know, seems like I, I don't need to interfere here. Just let things happen. That's not being diligent with the master's things. It's not giving, that's not going to yield a return. How long will you lie there? When will you arise? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. You know, a little becomes a lot before you realize it. That's the thing about a little. A little becomes a lot before you realize it. I always remember a conversation we had at the university when I was still working there, and uh, we had you know some common resources that people would use, some common processing power for overnight, you know, large batches of work. And I, I remember we were dispatched to the people who were using too much of it <laughs> to go have meetings with them. And I remember sitting there with the older man, much older than me a lot more authority than I had. And we listened patiently while the steward of this area was talking about, oh, we do it like this. And you know, sometimes it sometimes it gets a little bigger than we think, you know, you know, kind of thing. And we let him talk for a while and the older man said, you do that a lot more often than you think you do. Pulled out the report and showed. <laughs> I always remember that because that's what this is. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to rest. Is it really the exception? That's you got to start asking, is it really the exception that now and then I withdraw from activity? Now and then I stay my hand from doing this. You got to be watchful because it comes quickly. As he said, like a robber, poverty comes. Like an armed man, want comes. What's a robber? Uh, it's different from a thief. A thief is there to steal. A robber is there to take it from you if he needs to by force. An armed man 
right? This is a force to be reckoned with, a surprise attack, somebody trying to catch you off guard or unprepared or unarmed, or all of the above. The question really is, will there be anybody to rescue me once I've gotten into this situation and the time has come for delivery, you know, I have to have something to show for the master. If I've spent all that time relaxing instead of working for the Lord, then there won't be any supply, right? There won't be any friends. There won't be anybody indebted to me. Um, there won't be anybody to rescue me when the bad thing happens. That's the, the spiritual application of this. How long will you stay there? Seems like a little, but it's not. There's coming something serious to be reckoned with, and who will rescue you at that time? You know, we're, we all of us are going to face the judgment. The Master is coming back. Or we're going to Him, one or the other, soon. There's Proverbs 20 uh, at verse 4 that I would grab as well. All by itself, it says, The sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. Sluggard does not plow in the autumn. He will seek at harvest and have nothing. Well, in the autumn is the time for plowing. What it means is there is a time for action. When it comes to harvest and autumn, you know, what is autumn? Um, you know, and if you want to go astronomical and talk about a specific date on the calendar, you know, be my guest. But, you know, the truth is it's a little bit fuzzy. What's the weather at that time? How far along are the crops, you know, is, does it have to be that day? No, it doesn't have to be that day. Does it have to be that week? Probably not. But it has to happen. The beginning might be fuzzy. The ending might be fuzzy. But there is an end to autumn because winter follows it every year. <laughs> so when should I act? Well, I should act now. The time is to act. The time for action comes. Do it. This person who doesn't act will seek at harvest. So what does it mean? He will, he will you know, uh, he, uh, again, didn't plow in the autumn, but when the harvest comes, he'll be looking. It's not having made any effort. He still expects to receive something. That's us, you know, living that whole lie about salvation by faith alone, apart from works. I believe, and I believe I'll receive something for that belief. I'll receive salvation even if I don't do anything. Even if I don't act, if I don't obey, if I don't bring forth fruit for the Master, I still think that I'm going to be forgiven and still going to go to heaven? Uh, not so. How can we put our hands out at harvest when we didn't help? <laughs> he didn't recognize the time to work, but he sure knows the time to eat. <laughs> Right? The little red hen applies here. But it says he'll seek and have nothing. God told us already the outcome. That judgment is not going to go our way. If we are not working, we are not reaping. What a man sows, this will he also reap. Over in the next chapter, Proverbs 21, we have another look at these. 21, 25, and 26 is the verses. It's chapter 21, verses 25 and 26 in the Proverbs. All day long. Oh, I'm sorry. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and doesn't hold back. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. What does it mean? It means what he wants and what he's willing to work for aren't the same. That's how it is in the spirit, is what it means. Do we want peace in the spirit? Do we want peace in the Lord? Well, we can have that, but it means working while we have time, being put out, being inconvenienced, being, you know, used, spent, 
As Paul said, I'm poured out as a drink offering. There's what we want, and there's what we're willing to do. And those things need to be pretty close together, not at odds, <laughs> as it is here. So on the one um, verse there, you know, he has desire, but he, and his, his desire and his hands are at odds. On the other verse, at verse 26, he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and gives. The, the, the man who, who has not been faithful to the Lord wants the blessing, but the one who really is blessed is the one who isn't seeking the blessing. He's doling out the blessings. He's the one who's working for others. That's the same as Romans 12. If you would stop worrying about your own situation, then you would put others on your mind and get busy working for them and God will take care of you. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these will be added to you. You see, they're spiritual, aren't they? They're not just physical advice. They are spiritual in application. That's the meaning. Another proverb in 22, 13. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I'll be killed in the streets. <laughs> yes, a lion outside. I'll be killed in the streets. Right. This is about dangers real and imagined. We can come up with all kinds of what if, all kinds of scenarios about, oh, this could happen or that could happen, or what if this, what if that, you know, those are all the kinds of fear that keep us from taking action. That's what he's talking about. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I'll be killed in the streets. I can't go out to work. I can't go out to, to, to gather, to harvest. Um, there's a lion in the streets, which is, of course, preposterous. There's not a lion in the streets. This is a city. <laughs> How is everybody else going to work today? How is everybody else getting things done today when there's a lion out there? It's not true. It's an imagined danger. And we come up with all kinds of reasons why well, th that can't be done. I remember reading some financial guy who is probably not trustworthy, but he did say something positive that I thought was pretty cool. He said, in all of my seminars, I get uh, a whole lot of people who say, you can't do that here. That's not legal. That won't work in the current market. He said, I, I get probably 30 of those people, for every one person who says, can you show me how to do that? I think that's interesting. And I think what he said there is probably true. I don't know whether his advice works or not, but I think what he said about attitude is probably exactly right. If you let fear be in that driver's seat, you, well, there's a line in the streets. Oh, yeah, that, that'll never work. We can't do it. You can't do anything as long as fear is in the driver's seat. Proverbs 26. This one's an interesting one. It's verses 13 down to 16. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road. There's a lion in the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. It wears him out to bring it back again to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. That's Proverbs 26, verses 13 to 16. The first illustration, after the lion that we just covered, is the door, verse 14, the door turns on its hinges, the sluggard on his bed. What does that mean? Well, the door stays there, well, it moves, yeah, but it only moves back and forth. It's limited in motion and in reach. It only does so much. It doesn't leave that spot. 
It only has one track that it will follow. The sluggard stays in place, limited in motion and reach, is not willing to branch out, is not willing to try something new, is not willing to be expended, not willing to be extended to take on anything. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, wears him out to bring it back to his mouth. <laughs> that's that's kind of crazy, but you think about buries his hand in the dish, which, you know, of course, if you have teenagers, you've seen this happen with a bag of chips. But um, buries his hand is to say he's got a big appetite and no tact, right? <laughs> big appetite, no tact, no thoughtfulness about others. But that's the way it is when we spiritually are immature in the Lord. We're the ones who are taking. We're the ones who are needy. And we ought to be giving of ourselves. And we ought to be serving others, Romans 12. And yes, it wears them out to bring it back. Just, you know, the hand goes in there and it's just tiresome even to bring this handful of food back to the, to the mouth. It's just such a perfect picture of this unwillingness to do the slightest thing. Unwillingness to do the slightest thing. It just has to be perfect and absolutely convenient or I won't do it. I really appreciated what it said in the last verse. In the 16th verse, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Here he, you know, lies there, you know, has a limited range of motion, wants to be fed while he does nothing for others, doesn't participate in the work time, but wants the food time. But he's wise. He's the one who knows. That's the way it is in the Spirit. And it's true. Uh, you find that that's just the way things are. That you know The persons who do little or nothing for others, who contribute little or nothing, have got the most um, criticism, have the most <laughs> ideas about what other people should be doing. <laughs> Romans 12, 3 had said, uh, and we didn't read it at the time, but um, we'll read it now. Romans 12, 3 said, By the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than is appropriate, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. The fool is wiser in his own eyes, or the sluggard wiser in his own eyes. But that's not how we ought to be in the Spirit. The grace given to the apostle teaches us not to think more highly of ourselves than is appropriate. But we have also in Romans 12, at the 16th verse, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, associate rather with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. But that's not the way of the sluggard, see. The sluggard knows there's not harmony there. <laughs> He sits, he's above these things. That's why people should be serving him, because he deserves to be served. <laughs> Finally, it said he's wiser in his own sight than seven who can answer sensibly. That is, there are other people who are doing it. There are other people who are working. There are other people who are contributing to the work of the Lord and to the local congregation and to the needs of the saints. Why can't he do this? What's stopping him? What's in the way here? You say, well, it's a lion in the street. He's afraid. Ah, he may have convinced himself there's a lion, but what's at the bottom of that? It's this. He doesn't want to work. He's not sensible. Sensibility would be as in Matthew 25, as, or as Matthew 25 makes clear sensibility would be an awareness that there is coming a judgment. There is coming a reckoning. Yeah, the truth is that we are going to be judged. A judgment is coming. 
and we're going to give answer for what we have done and what we have not done. How we have used the blessings God has given us or how we have failed to use them. The return in the, in the spirit that we have made in the congregation or the lack thereof. All of this is going to be called into account in a judgment day. That's the truth. We can't hide the fact. We might, you know, conveniently forget or put that off or put it out of mind, but it's there whether we acknowledge it or not. It's going to happen. I'm doing you no favors if I lead you to believe that it doesn't matter what you do or whether you make a return to God, because it does matter whether I say so or not. There will be a judgment. There will be a reckoning. God does expect a return on this investment. So we're only fooling ourselves. We're only lying to ourselves. And we're not doing ourselves any favors, even though we might feel like, well, that's more comfortable now. I just put it out of mind, and I'm, I'm totally at ease. But that only is going to last as long as you're alive on this earth. As soon as a reckoning is called for you of your soul or the return of the Lord, whichever one comes first, you'll be found in a bad way. That's not what is best. So our, our genuine thoughtfulness, the genuine foresight, you know, the ultimate harvest is ourselves. Our souls are the harvest for God. And it is coming. It's a season. It's predictable. Every year there's one. We know it is coming. It's sure. So we need to be ready for that. So that's the examination of slothful, as, as the Lord called it. He said that was slothful. How is it? Well, this is how. So we've got to be honest with ourselves, and we've got to be busy serving others, and we have to be busy working for the Lord. We have to be thoughtful about the fact there's a judgment coming and thoughtful about the fact that, well, some good works take time. Some things take preparation, forethought. And be busy doing that sooner than later because, well, some day never comes. A little turns into a lot before you know it. All the things that the Proverbs said, they're spiritual. They're talking to me. If today you're not a Christian, become a Christian. Believe in Jesus, that he is the Son of God. Believe that God raises the dead. Put to death the old person of sin that is within you and form in repentance a new heart dedicated to God and to his service. Put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. That you might be raised from the dead a new creature created in him for good works. Christian friend, have you been walking in those good works? It's time to do so. If you haven't, repent. If you haven't, pray God for forgiveness, but let us pray for you too because we all need prayers. We all face temptations. We're here to build one another up and work on towards heaven, not to look down our noses at one another or hold grudges against one another. No. If anybody is owed, it's Jesus and we are the debtors. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing. Won't you come?